Okay, I'm Malcolm Van Delst, and this is an excerpt from Do the Wrong Thing, a book series or extra long novel that opens with a woman trying to kill herself. She says, I don't know why I tried to do this, and by way of explanation tells her life story. She talks to the reader while writing and includes diary entries. We're normally about two thirds through the series in book four, but since I've started to get edits back on book two, I've revisited book two. Uh, this section comes before the kicked out stuff I read over the last two weeks. I'm, I'm kind of going all over the place. Um, basically, when I find something that's rough and like wanting to bring it here and get some feedback. Um, Ava is navigating grade 11 in this piece, and she's obsessed with social, with the social her hierarchy she creates uh, based on the confidence that kids show. Um, I'll put my questions at the end. It's hard to imagine she's having sex with them, which is, I'm afraid to think, what she must be doing. Jerry and I have been in the same class since grade one. Well, we're not in the same high school classes because I take advanced and she takes college ones. Jerry is shy, nice, not mouthy and sarcastic like top tier girls, the ones who have sex. Yet Jerry is suddenly popular, not at Sebastian, but with fourth Fort Smith boys. Maureen, a top tier, second from the pinnacle, being Tia's best friend, is also shy and quiet. Wait, how are Maureen and, Maureen and Jerry both popular when they are shy? You have to be loud and courageous to be popular, don't you? I've known Jerry my whole life. I've gone to her birthday parties. She's come to mine. She's Catholic. She can't be having sex. Jerry is tall and thin. Her hair is so long it comes down to her butt. She wears more makeup than anyone at Sebastian, unless you count Frances, another tall, thin girl who lives in drugs, Moralton. Until I type this right now, I don't see it. But with her long, thin frame, blonde hair, and blue eyes, Jerry could be a model. At the time, though, all I see is not terribly smart, shy, ordinary. After high school, when I leave Jardinelle, I'll complain to my new friends that everyone in small towns decides who you are based on who your parents are and refuses to let you change. I'll bitch that half a year of drinking in grade 10 branded me party girl. I won't see the tendency to brand people in myself, though, until right now, when I realize what I did to Jerry. How did she meet those Fort Smith boys? Fort Smith is a 45-minute drive from Dardanelle, away from the big city of Arbor. People go to Fort Smith for the campgrounds or the Pioneer Village tourist attraction. We all go to that in grade two, three or four. Maybe she meets the boys at hockey tournaments in Fort Smith through her brother. Dan is two years older than Jerry and I. And like Jerry, he's popular outside the arrangement of people, the social structure I follow so closely. Dan will talk to any girl, whether she's cool or not. Boys within the structure I watch won't talk to girls lower than they are. Dan doesn't talk to Tia and Marie or the bad boys they hang around with, though. But this is his choice. He's not afraid to talk to them like I am. I'm in my dad's car driving home from grandmother, my grandmother's. As I round the gravel road's bend where it avoids a stand of trees before meeting the highway, I see Dan sitting in his parked white sports car in the driver's seat with the door open and his legs splayed out in front of him. His radio is playing Boston more than a feeling. Dan and Jerry live on this gravel road a few farms back. My window is down. It's a hot day. Hello, Dan says when I stop at the highway. He's friendly. Not in a fake, exaggerated way. He's relaxed, acknowledging our long history because our parents have been friends in some capacity as long as I've been alive. We're all part of the German Catholic community. He's treated me like this ever since I was a kid, I realize but I've never actually noticed him. I do now because every non-Catholic Sebastian girl, it seems, likes him. They're not coy or hesitant either, nor do they seem worried about rejection. I hear them say softly when his name is mentioned, smiling to themselves in a knowing way. Hi, I say. Dan looks at me appreciatively, openly, even though all he can see is my head and shoulders. He stretches his legs and adjusts in his seat. I begin to realize that if I pulled over and talked to him, the warmth that is flooding through me would continue. He might pull me down on his lap and kiss me. It wouldn't be desperate or weird though. It'd be smooth like butter, like the yellow gold of his hair or the tan of his skin. I drive on. 
It's strange that Dan feels harmless while boys with reputations like his usually intimidate me. I don't realize that Dan and I wouldn't become boyfriend and girlfriend and that it may or may not happen again if I'd stayed. I feel flattered, attractive even, Dan's tight jeans hugging his legs as they stretch out from the car fixed in my mind. The good feeling inside crests upwards. Hubris, a word that comes from my people, the Greeks, says the English teacher, Mr. Rosso. He smiles as if, he, as if he knows something we don't. Hands on his hips, tight shirt pulled across his chest and dress pants across his crotch, voice low and booming. He's a Tom Jones for Sebastian High. Hubris means excessive pride. It brings down flawed heroes, he says. Jerry is having a party and it's all anyone can talk about. It won't be the usual Sebastian crowd. It'll be filled with people from Fort Smith. Little old average Jerry, overcompensating with her makeup, is going to have a party that everyone is talking about. How does this happen? She doesn't even register on the Sebastian social scale. On the night of, Liz, Kathy, and I drive up to Jerry's place. Cars fill her yard, the driveway, the paths running from her house to the barns behind it, and both sides of the road out front, almost to the neighboring farms. We park at the end of one row of cars along the road and trek back to the house, trying not to get our shoes muddy. Inside, the front porch floor is mayhem, a massive pile of coats at the back and a mess of footwear at the front. G'day, Jerry smiles. She's standing at the door between the porch and kitchen. She's the only person I know who uses g'day all the time. Tonight, she says it over and over again as people arrive, as she motions them to enter. Here. Put your coats upstairs in my mom's bedroom, she says to us. She abandons her station and leads us, completely at ease, as if there's nothing to explain, as if her and I have no history, which in a lot of ways we don't. She only came to my birthday parties because my mother invited her, and I only went to hers for the same reason. We were never really friends. I guess she doesn't realize how I've categorized her all these years. She wouldn't be this friendly if she did. G'day, she continues to say as we maneuver, maneuver past people, Boys I've never seen before smiling gratefully and turning as she passes to watch her. The only difference is that, is that with me, she shows no hesitation and nervousness, like she does with everyone else, even as she smiles. The house soon becomes so crowded that it takes 10 minutes to get from the living room to the kitchen counter where the drinks are. Liz, Kathy, and I find a place against the wall in the living room, against the second staircase leading upstairs, and stare at the unfamiliar faces. We don't know anyone.